I was down in the basement trying to disconnect the drain in the air conditioning unit when I heard the phone ring. Natalie was cleaning the dishes in the kitchen, so I figured she would pick up the phone. I heard her pick up the phone through the vent from the second floor. Hello? Kathy, it's good to hear from you. How long has it been? I didn't like Katie. She was Natalie's high school friend, and I had always disliked her. Luckily, we moved out of Lancaster shortly after we got married. I wish it was a little farther away. Yes, that's what I thought. Eight years have gone by really fast. What's going on? I didn't like the way this conversation was unfolding, but I only had one side of it. Katie, hold on a second. Steve's working in the basement. Let me go close the door. I'll be right back. I heard Natalie hang up the phone and went across the room to close the door. I walked through the basement and quickly picked up the wall extension cord. Hi, Kathy, I'm back. What were you going to tell me about? Nat, there's a medical device conference at the Holiday Inn in Lancaster next weekend. And guess who's attending? You're kidding. They'll both be there? Both of them. They're coming in Friday night and staying all weekend. How do you know that? Jared called me this morning and he really wants to see you. He asked me to call and see if I could invite you to come to Lancaster for the weekend. It will be just you and me, Jared and Martin. I held the rag on the end of the phone. I really wanted to jump through the receiver and grab Katie by the neck. What the hell was she suggesting? I don't know, Kathy. If I can get away, I'd love to come. I'll have to do a little coaxing with Steve. As soon as I find out, I'll call you back. You remember how good a time we had at the last convention when they were here, don't you, Natalie? You're damn right I am. Every time I give the kids breakfast in the morning? I can't believe you had the nerve to name that baby Jared. Why not? Steve doesn't guess anything. He thinks Jared is his, though they don't look alike at all. Damn, this conversation was getting worse and worse. I quickly replayed the situation in my head and found out that eight years ago, Natalie and Katie had had an affair with these two guys, and Natalie had ended up pregnant by Jared. She had passed the baby off as mine and naturally never said a word about the affair. Now Natalie and Katie were planning to get back together with these guys. Kathy, I'll call you back as soon as I can. If I can't get away with an overnight stay, I might be able to come over for at least a day. It'll be better than nothing. Okay. Call me as soon as you know. After we all hung up the phones, I had some time to think. We had three children. Jenny and Lynn were in high school, and Jared came along about eight years ago. The two girls are good-looking and have bright personalities. They are studying hard in school and preparing for college. Jared, on the other hand, is uninspired. He is not interested in school or sports. I liked Jared even though he had his flaws. Natalie opened the door to the basement. How are you doing, Steve? Are you ready for coffee? I'm almost done. I'm going to go upstairs now. I think I'll take a shower before I do anything else. After a long, hot shower, I sat in front of the TV with my family. I was trying to figure out what I should do. This wasn't a small mistake Natalie had made and regretted later. This was a thing she had done knowingly and was going to do again. I didn't know if I wanted to stop it and maintain the status quo or fix the situation. If I decided to fix the situation, I had to figure out how to do it. I felt really stupid because in 20 years of marriage, it had never even occurred to me that Natalie might be screwing around with someone. Steve, I talked to Kathy from Lancaster today. She asked me to come down and spend the weekend with her. Do you have any problem with that? No, not really. I'll be busy at work, so if my parents can watch the kids, it'll be fine on one condition. What's that? Don't forget to bring your cell phone in case there is a problem. Okay? Thank you, darling. I'll take my cell phone with me and I promise I won't have any problems. The Volvo car won't break down and I'll be able to fit a lot of shopping in it. I'll probably go Friday morning and be back Sunday night. Will that suit you? I think it's pretty good. Have fun. Natalie walked out into the kitchen, and I heard her calling Katie to confirm their plans for the weekend. She didn't seem to care at all about the fact that she was cheating and that there would be consequences. I told her that I wanted to do some work on the computer before bed and that I would get up later. Finding the website for the East Coast Medical Equipment Dealers Convention in Lancaster was easy. It had everything about the convention. All the exhibits were listed with a floor map. A list of lectures and seminars with times and locations. 
There was also a list of all the exhibitors with their hotel room numbers. Jared Kramer and Martin Blank were staying in room 411 from Friday through Monday. I found home addresses and phone numbers for both in Baltimore. I found a company that offered DNA tests by mail. The tests ranged from paternity testing to probable national origin. Most tests cost less than $100. Samples could be taken at home and mailed with a check or paid online. I filled out an application form online and paid for four paternity tests with my PayPal. After printing out the sample collection instructions, I gathered all the items I needed to get the samples. I printed out a mailing label and prepared a padded envelope for priority mailing. I prepared some mailing cartons for the CDs and prepared a stack of blank CDs. Jared and Martin's wives will probably want a copy of the evening's events. I worked for a corporate security consulting firm. The work schedule was flexible, but since I had free time, I decided to take a week's vacation. Another nice perk of the job was the availability of various equipment that I could use to gather information. By this time, I had pretty much decided that I was done with the marriage. The fact that she'd had an affair eight years ago and forced me to raise a child was bad enough. But the way Kathy and her joking around making a fool of me was too much. There was no way I could forgive that. And now she was doing it again. It had to end for good. The next day, I took DNA samples from the kids. They thought it was cool. Then I went to the bank and transferred almost all of my savings into a trust for Jenny and Lynn, but left 12000 in cash. I was able to arrange things so that the trust was safe from my wife or a conniving divorce attorney. I arranged to have all credit cards and checking accounts canceled Monday morning and a new account opened in my name only. I was going to lock up the house so Natalie would have to find another place to sleep. I was sure she could figure out some legal way to get into the house, but I hoped to have other things settled by then. Our son, Jared, we could decide about later. Even though he wasn't mine, I felt responsible for him. I stopped by Seymour Schlump's office. Seymour had been my lawyer since we came to reading. He was honest and hardworking. I liked him. I explained the situation to him as best I could. He pushed me to make sure there was no chance of reconciliation. In addition to the divorce proceedings, I asked him to contact Jared Kramer and see if there was anything he could do about my son. I offered to pay $500 a month in child support, retroactively, or ask him to foster the child. The last option was to have him relinquish all rights to Jared so I could formalize his adoption. I was sure he would agree to the last option. Seymour had everything he needed. I promised to send him pictures and audio tapes that he could use. He gave me an office email address and some parcels with an address for printed materials. Betty Moore was the most obnoxious real estate agent I have ever met. There was very little about this woman that I liked, but she was a tough, dedicated worker. I advertised our house for sale and signed several powers of attorney for her. I told her that any signatures Natalie needed, she would have to get herself. She laughed and assured me there would be no problem. I told her that the locksmith would give her a set of new keys. A wireless video camera disguised as a smoke detector was best suited for the job. I took two of them and four bugs. I also needed a clipboard, a set of cubes with the company logo on them, and three laptops. I wrote up an order on company letterhead to replace the malfunctioning smoke detector in room 411. I stowed the computers and all the equipment needed for recording in a regular suitcase. I brought a small stepladder with me. The Holiday Inn had room 311 available, and I booked it under a different name just for Friday. It had wireless internet. Walmart had the best deals on discarded cell phones. I took two just in case. A few years ago, my mom and dad moved into an old farmhouse near Lebanon. It was too big for the two of them, but dad had always dreamed of it. He had a big garden, chickens, and an orchard. Jared loved to go there. They were willing to put up with us for as long as it took. Dad liked Jared, but he called him Jake. He used to say Jared looked like a sandwich salesman. Jared seemed to like Jake better than his real name. A few years ago, Dad bought a big motorhome and a little Kia to pull it around in. He used it three times and lost interest in it. I told Daddy to get the motorhome started and ready. I knew the girls would grumble about having to get away from their friends for the summer. They still had one more year of high school left before college and they wanted to go to a prep school in Vermont. Natalie didn't want to spend the money. Even though they had a year age difference, they were in the same grade, don't ask. I had no idea how Jared would take it. I would deal with the situation at school later. Right now, I had other problems to deal with. At least all the kids liked being with my mom and dad. Natalie left early the next morning. 
She was all dolled up and thanked me again for letting her spend time with her friends. I told the kids to get ready for their trip and bring their stuff with them for the whole summer. As I suspected, the girls grumbled to high heaven. I told them to bring brochures from the prep school in Burlington, and suddenly everything was rosy. They brought all their school clothes with them just in case. Surprisingly, Jared seemed to be excited about the trip. Jenny walked over to me and just stood there. What do you need, Jenny? Are you packed already? Dad, I'm 17. I'm not a kid anymore. Tell me what's going on. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Are you and your mom having problems? I don't think that's something I want to discuss with you. If there was something going on, mom and I would try to keep it from you. Why don't you pack the rest of your things? No, dad. I'm serious. Things look different this time. Lynn and I want to know what's going on. We think we have a right to know. I didn't want to say anything to her about it, but I knew it would come up sooner or later. Okay, I'm not very happy with your mom and I's relationship. Things aren't working out in the best way. I don't know exactly what's wrong, but I know something is wrong. Is mom cheating on you? I paused for a long moment. I'm not sure, but I think so. Jenny turned and shouted as she climbed the stairs. You were right, Lynn. What does that mean? Better let Lynn tell you. Lynn was coming down the stairs towards Jenny and me. Tell him, Lynn. Do I have to? Yes. He knows, but you still have to tell him. Lynn stared at her feet. Finally, she spoke. About four months ago, I was skipping school with one of the guys from my lab class. We stopped by the house so I could buy some CDs. It was a Wednesday when Mom usually goes shopping. You were at work in Boston, I think. As we were walking down the street, we saw a gold SUV pull up in the driveway. That guy, Floyd, who works with you, got out of the car and Mom left him in the house. We sat outside for almost two hours until he got out. I waited another ten minutes and went into the house. Mom was taking a shower and your room was all messed up. I left and went back to school for the rest of the day. When we got home, she had already started dinner. The bed was made and there was a pile of sheets in the dryer. I told Jenny, but she didn't believe me. No one said anything for about 30 seconds. Thank you for telling me, girls. It's something I never wanted to hear, but it's good that you told me. Jenny noticed a tear in my eye. She took Lynn's hand, and they went back upstairs without another word. Dad showed up just as the locksmith arrived. While the locks were being changed, I put all of Natalie's clothes, shoes, and personal belongings into 33-gallon trash bags. The bags almost completely filled the back of my navigator. After chatting with the girls, I decided to stop by work before heading to the convention. Centerex was a locally-based company, but was quickly spreading throughout the area. Their marketing people did a great job of finding potential places to expand, but the company couldn't train people fast enough to fill them, especially in management positions. They tried to talk me into a new office and offered me several different locations trying to get me interested. Natalie refused to move and wouldn't even discuss it. If I stayed where I was, I would be in the same position forever. Moving would give me a promotion, more money, and some power. I went straight to the office of the president of the company. Is Mr. Turcott free for a few minutes? I think he can squeeze you and Steve. Wait a minute. I'd always liked Turcott's secretary, and I guess she felt the same way about me. George Turcott came out of his office and extended his hand to me. I hope you've come to give me some good news, Steve. Yes and no. Helen, bring coffee to the office and hold my calls for a while. Okay, what can I do for you, Steve? First, I have decided that I would like to be reconsidered for one of the new leadership positions in the place where you feel I would be most valuable. That's great news. If you don't have a preference, I have a great option that I would love to pick. How do you feel about Anchorage? Believe it or not, that sounds perfect. Would the first week of September suit you? I think it's going to work. I'll personally start doing everything on Monday. What's the second thing? I know it sounds strange, but I wish Floyd Cooper had been sent there to work for me. George leaned back in his chair and chuckled. You found out, didn't you? I don't know what you mean, Mr. Turcott. I couldn't keep a straight face when I said that. Steve, no one wanted to tell you anything. I didn't like what was going on, but I didn't know what to do about it. 
If I fired Floyd, I was afraid you'd find out, and I didn't want that to happen. I decided it was best to try to keep things quiet. Unfortunately, Floyd Cooper turned out to have a big mouth. He started bragging about his affair with your wife. His secretary, Tracy, came to me and complained when Floyd started showing pictures of himself and your wife that he had downloaded to his computer. The legal department is working something out now, but I've kept them on a short leash trying to protect you. Now that you know, I can just fire Floyd. It's a lot more practical than spending the money to send him to Alaska to fire him there later. You're right. I was hoping I could do a little more damage, but I guess revenge is a pretty poor management technique. I'll go along with what you think is fair. George pressed the intercom button. Helen, put me through to Tracy Tolliver. After explaining to Tracy what we were doing, we headed to Floyd's office. Floyd was at work in Allentown. Tracy Tolliver was a very beautiful woman. She was just under 30 and she was aging very well. The combination of her blonde hair and blue eyes had always fascinated me. She was only a few inches taller than five feet, but she held herself like an Amazon. I never understood how Floyd ended up with the best secretary in the entire building. I later learned that she had asked three times to be moved to my office, but my secretary wouldn't give up her seat. You'll need these. She held out four blank CDs. Look under Bill's Payable and click on Stoddard. Make one for yourself, one for your attorney, one for our legal department, and one for Floyd's wife. I have postcards ready, but I need your attorney's name. I was stunned by her efficiency. This woman knew exactly what she was doing and exactly how to do it. Seymour Schlump. His office is on Franklin Street. George and I went to Floyd's office while Tracy started typing up the last address sticker. There were 20 pictures of Floyd and Natalie having every kind of sex imaginable. They were low quality and looked like they had been taken on a webcam. It also meant that Floyd probably had a full-length video somewhere. They weren't filmed in our bedroom. George tried to be polite, but he just couldn't help looking at my wife like that. I was a little upset because every guy in the building had probably seen what I was looking at right now. After checking them all out, I just copied the file to each of the blank CDs. Tracy glanced around the room. Delete the whole damn file when you're done copying that crap. I gave Tracy the four discs. She put each one in an envelope and handed one back to me. Don't let your kids get a hold of these. I'll mail these three on Monday morning. I told George about my plans for the Holiday Inn. He didn't like the company getting involved, but he agreed. We had a work crew in the neighborhood on Monday, and he said he would have them come by and remove the cameras I was going to install. George and I shook hands. I thanked him and he thanked me. I think it was a good meeting. The drive from Reading to Lancaster took about an hour. Parking in the back lot, I checked in, paid cash, and got a key. The first thing I did was change into my work clothes. The maid on the fourth floor was friendly enough. I showed her my work order, and since no one had checked into the room yet, she let me in. It took about 20 minutes to install the fake smoke detectors. The room had two double beds. I managed to position the cameras to get a good shot of each bed and part of the room. No big deal, I was a professional. I hoped that none of the occupants would notice that they were in a room with three smoke detectors. I went back to the room, changed my clothes, and started setting up all my equipment. The pizza delivery guy arrived about half an hour later. By three o'clock, everything was ready. Both cameras were working perfectly. The pictures were clear even with the normal lighting in the room. My laptop worked with a good high-speed connection. I set one camera to record whenever there was any movement and triggered the other one manually. Damn, I liked my job. I had one problem. I didn't know where Natalie was. I dialed her cell phone number. Hi, Steve. Isn't that a great caller ID? Hey, Natalie. Just want to make sure everything is going well. The kids are with my parents and I'm still at work. Where are you now? We're still at Kathy's. Her husband, Ray, is going to watch their kids. Kathy and I are going to have a sleepover at Melanie Thompson's house. A few other girls from school will be there. It should turn out great. Sounds like fun. Take some pictures. In your pervert dreams. Who is this guy Ray that Kathy's with? Do I know him? I think so. That's Ray Wilson. He was on the soccer team with you. Yeah, that's right. I remember Ray. What does he look like? A little heavier, a little balder, and a little softer. Sounds like normal aging to me. Okay, Natalie. I'm letting you go.
Have fun and call me if you have any problems. Love you. Love you back. Bye. I remembered that Ray was a big son of a bitch and a nasty one at that. If they were leaving, they'd be here soon. I figured they'd use Natalie's car, which was fine with me. About that time, there was some activity in the room. The first camera started recording as intended. There was a lot of idle chatter about the entryway and other trivia. They were both pretty big guys. Jared had dark hair and dark eyes while Martin was a little bald and pale. Both seemed in good shape. The bug picked up the ringing of Jared's cell phone. Hello, this is the horse farm. What can I do for you? The two of them enjoyed it immensely. I wondered how many times they had already used it. We're here, honey, and we're hot trotters. What do you like? I figured he was talking to Katie. Okay. This is the outback. Meet you on the stairs in two minutes. At least they were going to feed them first. I sat there freaking out about the whole thing. If I wasn't so caught up in the mechanics of what I was doing, I'd probably be getting ready to stomp someone. I immediately left the room and headed for the stairs at the end of the hallway. Standing around the corner of the building, I saw Natalie and Katie waiting for me in the lobby. They were giggling like two schoolgirls. A minute later, Jared and Martin came out of the elevator. Natalie immediately took Jared's hand and kissed him on the cheek, the way a wife kisses her husband. The four of them went out and got into a black Mercedes. As they drove away, I looked around the lot and found the Volvo parked in the last row. At least it was trying to be somewhat inconspicuous. About five minutes later, I was already loading trash bags of her clothes and other belongings into the van. I was sure she'd come back from the restaurant a little tipsy and wouldn't notice anything in the car. I left a note on the driver's seat, explaining that the locks on the house had been changed and that I was taking the kids on an extended vacation. I stopped at Taco Bell and fortified my system for the rest of the night. They'll be eating ribs and I'll be getting a burrito suprema? Life just isn't fair. I went back to my room and waited for the inevitable. I tried to think of what else I could do. It was about an hour before they came back to the room. I knew what would happen when they arrived, but I didn't know exactly what to do. I came to the conclusion that they had not gathered to play canasta. I knew what was going to happen for the rest of the evening, and I didn't like it. I believed that Natalie and I were doing well. I assumed she was happy because she never complained or showed any dissatisfaction with anything at all. When Jared was born, she said all kinds of things to me. She said she was glad we had a boy because every man should have a son. I wondered if she had called Jared's real father and congratulated him at the first opportunity. Damn, it was so depressing to think about. I regretted living all these years with this woman who could cheat on me at any time and feel no guilt for it. A woman who could make me raise someone else's child and consider it humor. It was hard to feel any compassion for her at that moment. I continued to prepare everything I needed. I guess I was over-preparing, but this was my only chance, and I didn't want to miss anything. They burst into the room laughing and giggling. Martin had brought a bottle of some kind of drink with him, and they managed to fill four glasses in the first minute. Katie pulled two pillows off the bed and threw them on the floor. Okay. Let's begin. I couldn't believe I was watching my wife making love to another man and doing it with great enthusiasm. I was not only infuriated but also jealous. The cameras were working perfectly. I had to take my eyes off the orgy to make sure I was filming everything. It was almost as good as a regular adult film. I'm getting close. Get ready for dessert, shouted Jared. Thank you very much, Martin. You could have at least let me know you were ready. Look at all the good things I've wasted. At intervals, I was able to take some pictures with my zoom camera. After that, both couples engaged in active missionary sex. I got some good shots from this episode. It was break time in room 411. Katie had gone to take a shower and Natalie was brushing her teeth. Jared and Martin were just lying there drinking beer. I picked up the discarded cell phone and dialed Baltimore's number. Hello, Mrs. Kramer? This is Walter Perkins at the medical device convention in Lancaster. Are you Jared Kramer's wife? Yeah, but he's not here right now. I know. Your husband and Mr. Blank received special recognition today at the convention. We'd like to send you pictures from the ceremony. Do you have an email account we could send them to? Of course. It's eKramer on bbw.net. That's great. Do you happen to have Martin Blank's wife's email address so I can send the pictures together? Sure. She's in bablank at vault.com. Okay. 
That's all I need. You'll have the pictures in a few minutes. Sure, she could have tracked the data transmission through the hotel's wireless, but I didn't care because there was no connection to me. In room 411, they had a break to talk while they gained a second wind. So, Natalie, is your dear husband taking care of my son for me? Of course, silly girl. It's been eight years and the idiot still hasn't realized the baby isn't his. Steve lives in his own world. He couldn't possibly have realized he had a letter in the mail. It would be nice if you send a birthday present or something every now and then. Oh yeah, that would be great. All he needs is to see something like that to give him a clue. Katie cut in. Hell, I have three snot-nosed kids running around my house and my dummy is not the father of any of them. He's so busy sucking down beer he'll never be able to realize they're not his. Everyone had a good laugh at poor Ray, and I got a good sound clip. I was getting bored with the whole thing, so I decided to call it a night. I logged on to and connected to an unused room. After a few entries, I had a live feed from room 411 to the internet site. I added a headline to the page, Natalie and Katie do Jared and Martin. My wife and her girlfriend decided the break was over and started getting the guys in for another run. The webcast was going well, and the number of watchers had passed 100. It took me about 20 minutes to get everything I needed to put together. I left the live streaming computer for last. By now, over 400 perverts had watched the show, and I'm sure a few were recording it to distribute later. I turned off the last rig and called Ray Wilson. Hey, Ray, are you sober? Yeah, who's that? Just a friend, Ray. I want you to listen to something. I played a short audio clip I recorded with Kathy. Son of a bitch. Where did you get that? Ray, she's in room 411 at the Holiday Inn. There are two guys there and they're pretty big. So if you plan on going, take a bat or something or they might beat the shit out of you. Ray didn't say a word and I heard the phone rattle. I had just finished loading the Navigator when Ray jumped out of the Ford pickup with a short aluminum bat for a little league game and stormed into the building. I was tired but enjoying the ride back to Lebanon. The motorhome was all ready to go. I gave Dad a set of keys to the new house. Mom would go to Lancaster to see Natalie while Dad took the boys to our house and moved all the furniture and stuff out. They had plenty of room to store things in the barn. Mom thought it would be interesting to hear the story from Natalie's side. My parents had the number of one of the discarded cell phones. I have my own cell phone, but I plan to have it turned off most of the time. On Monday, my dad will take the stuff in the Navigator back to Cenerex. It was too late to start, but I wanted to be away by the time Natalie figured out what was going on. We had reserved an RV parking lot near Hagerstown where we could get on the highway in the morning. The girls planned the trip for us. They did a pretty good job. The only thing I did was limit the distance between stops because the gasoline was killing me. I was glad I brought a lot of money with me. We finished our three days at Disney and were heading to Chattanooga to see the aquarium. Jenny asked if she could call her mom. Hi, Mom. It's Jenny. Yeah. Just wanted to let you know everything's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know. We're all having a good time, even Jared. We miss you too. We'll call every couple days to let you know. Okay. Tomorrow night we leave for Orlando. We will be at Disney for almost a week. We have park tickets for every day. I couldn't believe it. My daughter was framing her mother. That's so cool. We're staying at the Orleans Hotel right in Disneyland. It's going to be so great. Okay, we'll call you in a couple days. Bye. Jenny, I can't believe you did that. It was really rotten. I know. Lynn and I thought it would be appropriate. You know, of course, that your mom is on the phone right now buying a plane ticket and booking a room. That's what we thought she'd do. She needs a vacation anyway. Picked up Lynn. Gerard watched the DVD and enjoyed his company. Two weeks later, Lynn called her mother. Natalie was very upset because she had spent a whole week looking for us in Orlando. Lynn said that we had decided to go to Six Flags and tried to change the subject of the conversation. Lynn and Jenny kept her on the phone for almost 20 minutes, listening to her rant and rave. Finally, Jenny said she was sorry if she had misled her and would call her back in a couple days. My demonesses giggled for another half hour after they hung up. The next week was hectic. We parked at Smoky Mountains and the kids were busy while I took care of business. Seymour delivered the divorce papers to Natalie. She didn't know I was doing it until he arrived. He said she was having a seizure. 
He explained that she could hire an attorney to fight the divorce and told her what she was facing. He had pictures of her and Floyd, the group in room 411, and the results of the DNA test. Jenny and Lynn were mine, but not Jared's. Natalie hired a lawyer, but ended up going along with what Seymour suggested anyway. Seymour visited the big man Jared in the hospital in Baltimore. Kathy's husband did a great job on him and Martin. Ray was facing about five years in prison. I asked Seymour to help him. Both of my wife's lovers were in the hospital for over a week, and while they were recovering, they were served with divorce papers. When they were discharged, they had nowhere to go. Jared signed a paper waiving all rights to his son Jared. In addition to broken bones and ribs, Ray had literally smashed their genitals with a bat. The doctors didn't hold out much hope for recovery. Betty Moore found a buyer for the house. It took her a lot of work to convince Natalie to sign the papers, but she finally got her to sign. I didn't have to sign anything or go to the closing because I had signed the power of attorney. The summer was quickly coming to an end. I had a chance to develop a good relationship with the kids. I spent a lot of time talking to Jared. He loved it in Lebanon where mom and dad lived. I asked him if he would like to stay on the farm full time and he immediately agreed. Dad really liked having him around and I knew he would love to take him in. Seymour filed adoption papers so that my parents would have the legal right to provide for him and take care of him. The only thing Seymour didn't like was getting Natalie to agree to it. Natalie didn't know it, but her father had also gotten Jared's name legally changed to Jake. The girls fell in love with school in Burlington. The end of summer in Vermont was beautiful. We spent a few days getting them settled in, and then Jake and I headed back to the Keystone State. I contacted Mr. Turcott and found out that everything was ready for my move to Alaska. Tracy was already in place and had set up a temporary office. This was good news. She had also rented an apartment for me and had the company car ready for my arrival. I left the navigator with my father to get rid of. Six months later, things finally settled down. The divorce was final. The girls did well in school and both received scholarships to James Madison University in Virginia. They were happy and excited to be on their own. Natalie hadn't heard from Natalie except for a few phone calls. Jake was doing better in school, and he was head over heels in his new hobby of raising bantam chickens. One day, Natalie came to visit him. She was driving an old Ford Escort and told her father that she had to sell the Volvo to pay for her divorce expenses. That was total bullshit because I ended up paying for both lawyers. While she was there, Natalie insisted on calling Jake Jared. Jake corrected her each time and eventually left. Natalie began to lash out at my father, talking about how vile it was to take away a child's birthright. My father said it was too easy a blow, so he refused to take it and just left with Jake. Jake's mother never went back to him. She received $11,000 from the sale of the house. Katie and her decided to celebrate the divorce and went to Las Vegas. All the money was gone in four days. I don't know what Natalie is doing now or where she lives. Maybe she moved to Baltimore. Needless to say, I love Alaska.